Oh, much better. Okay, earthworm dissection. Ready to dissect some earthworms, and I wanted to show you what some of the anatomical structures look like under a dissecting microscope. All the following images were shot at about 20 times magnification. First, uh, let's look at some external anatomy, starting with the setae, which are stiff bristles made of chitin. These are found on the lateral ventral portion of the earthworm. Usually you can't see the setae, but you can feel them. And note how I'm brushing against the setae with my probe and I can feel a very stiff bristle. Once you find them, note how they occur in pairs on either side of the ventral surface. Okay, so now let's look at the anterior end of the worm. And of course we can find the mouth right here, but we're gonna count down about 15 segments or so. When we get there, we'll see this kind of subtle opening, which is one of the sperm ducts. So sperm leaves this duct whenever the earthworm mates with another earthworm. Right now, there. just anterior to this duct is an opening to the seminal receptacles, but that's really hard to see. Now, when the sperm leaves the sperm duct, it flows along the sperm groove, which you can see right here, running to the posterior from the sperm duct. Now we're gonna look at some internal anatomy. We've already carefully dissected the earthworm and opened it up, and we're looking at the anterior end. The first structure that's pointed out. We talked earlier about septum, you know, septa being this dividing segment, and each one of those bumps that you saw in that earthworm corresponds to an internal septum. And so here's one internal septum, here's the next internal septum, and so it's kind of cool as he dissects this out, you can see segment, 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 that all of these little connective tissue fibers are those internal septa is the nerve cord, which is this whitish cord, which ends in the brain. Now the brain is very small and you can't see it in this image, probably because I think I stuck a pin through it. But if you're careful, you might be able to see the very small brain at the end of this cord. Next, we're gonna to move toward the posterior of the earthworm and point out the structures as we see them. The first structure is the pharynx, which is just posterior to the mouth. Now down from this area, we see these large glandular organs called seminal vesicles. This is where sperm is produced. And just anterior to these are these small lobe-shaped seminal receptacles, which is where sperm from another earthworm can be stored. Now underneath and around all these structures are these tubular dark organs called aortic arches. These act like hearts to pump blood. Okay, so quick question. If the pharynx was up here, can you guys see the mouse on my screen? My mouse? Yes? Okay, cool. If the pharynx was up here, thanks for the thumbs up, and the aortic arches are here, then what tube, what's the white tube that runs underneath the aortic arches? Anybody got a guess? Part of the digestive tract. What comes after the pharynx in the digestive tract? Type it in the chat box. Give me a thumbs up if you got a guess. Esophagus. Esophagus. Good answer. The esophagus. Very good. So pharynx, esophagus, crop, gizzard. Good answer. And as you move things around, you can see the shape of them. And there's about five pairs of these. Now, as we move down, in the digestive system, we see the crop, which is thin-walled, and it's used to store food. And then just posterior to this is the gizzard, which is much tougher, and it's used to grind food. And then finally, exiting the gizzard, we see the long intestine, which runs all the way down to the anus. Finally, we move posterior to the gizzard, and notice this dark blood vessel running along the dorsal surface of the intestine. This is the dorsal vessel, which returns blood to the anterior end of the earthworm. See all these internal divisions right here? This is so cool. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And the little grooves or bumps that you feel in that earthworm, each one corresponds to an internal division. 
and then it's intestine all the way down to the anus. But this video is really neat because you can see these blood vessels and how large they are. It's kind of cool. Along the sides, we see the septa, which we cut through when we were dissecting the earthworm. These separate the segments of the earthworm. Now, if we carefully move the intestine to the side, we can see the small whitish nerve on the ventral surface, which is called the ventral nerve cord. Just next to this is the small, dark, subneural blood vessel. Okay, well, that's a magnified. There you go. So kind of a, kind of a cool, kind of a cool video. I thought um, pretty good view of the earthworm, which I uh, definitely thought was pretty neat. Uh, let me show you a different one. Um, show you this guy. Last time we were together, we talked about this foot kind of coming out of the mantle of a, of a clam to move him around. And uh, it's not a particularly fast process, but this is really cool. That's his foot, right? And he doesn't have any eyes, so he can't see around him. So he's just checking out the environment kind of slowly. And he's a burrowing clam that they just dropped into an aquarium. And this right out here, this is in-current siphon, so he's sucking water in to get food from his environment. So he doesn't have to be very exposed to uh, kind of check out his environment. He's still very safe in the shell. And so this is kind of cool because he'll be able to essentially use his foot to bury himself in the sand or the soft dirt and uh, leave his in-current siphon and ex-current siphon just above the surface of the sand and nobody's gonna know he's there and he's very safe and he can eat and grow and no one knows he's there. Look at those siphons, that's so cool. He's using his foot now, wiggling himself underneath this, you know, aquarium pebbles because he's in captivity, right? Pretty cool. Makes you wonder how he doesn't get any pebbles in his siphons, right? Things crazy. All right, he's pretty well buried. Just leave his little siphon up there, and you know, if the pebbles weren't completely white, <laughs> it's uh. You know, you'd never know he was there if he was in the bottom of a lake or pond or something like that. So I thought that was kind of a cool example of that foot doing its job, you know, digging him down there a little bit. Kind of a cool, kind of a cool deal. And the other critter we talked about yesterday was a scallop. And uh, we talked about the idea that they can kind of open and close their shells quickly and kind of shoot off the ocean floor and how that seemed like a really silly method of escaping your predator until you consider your predator as a starfish and he's super super duper slow so you're probably a pretty good strategy so check this out It's like they've only got enough energy for like, I don't know, a half dozen little pumps and then they just stop and sink. <laughs> Well, I think you get the idea. It's pretty cool, right? Kind of a weird, kind of a weird little critter. Weird way to get away from stuff, but uh, gets the job done for sure. So, anyways, let's jump back into it here. This is, I think, about where we left off. Um, here you've got uh, your mantle, um, the foot, which we just saw in that video, dig the clam into the soil. Oops, hold on. 
there, folds in. Um, the mantle, the foot that's trying to dig that clam into the soil or otherwise moving the clam. And then the gill inside that's allowing, you know, uh, oxygen to be pulled from the ocean water and uh, put into the bloodstream of that clam. So the foot is the video I just showed you. So I feel like you probably know that reasonably well. Um, the scallop, we just watched him swim away, kind of cool. Using the foot to open and close that shell quickly to bounce around the ocean floor or to bounce off of the ocean floor and try to escape from the predators. Um, some scallops have lots of little eyes on the margin of their shell. And uh, so some of them don't have eyes like the clams we looked at, but others like this guy right here is an eye. And this guy right here is an eye. And this guy right here is an eye. And so he actually has many, many, many eyes on the edge of his shell. So he can see when predators are around and, uh, you know, kind of make a choice to close up and stay safe. So clams are probably our easiest to label. And they're also very, very, very similar organs uh, when you look at scallops and oysters and those kinds of things. Um, but clams are filter feeders. They're going to eat in the very similar method that our sponges were eating, where they're basically sucking in ocean water and they're pulling organic material like algae and bacteria from that ocean water and using that as their food source. Um, they're going to circulate water through their body using siphons or tubes. If you might be familiar with the word siphon, like you can create a siphon or siphon a liquid out of a container by like putting a tube in and creating suction with, you know, a bike pump or your mouth or whatever. And you can like suck on this tube and get fluid kind of flowing from one container to another. That's a siphon. And so the in-current siphon is going to suck water in. That makes sense, right? It starts with the word in the X current siphon is gonna take water out. And so it's kind of circulating in through the organism's body and out the X current siphon. Uh, your bivalves don't have radula, right? Radula was the many, many teeth on this little organ that's like sandpaper that slugs and snails used to scrape up leaves and leaf litter and things of that nature. And uh, bivalves don't have that. Uh, they have two shells with no radula. There's no mouth needed. They're just sucking in ocean water and they're after moss and algae and, and things like that. So you don't really need radula when you're eating, you know, microscopic things and algae, but uh, they are filter feeders. And so that's a cool, a cool way to get nutrition. And uh, it's pretty energy efficient because you don't have to move around a whole lot. So there's a, a benefit there. Um, let me know if I'm clicking around too quickly. So here's an okay diagram for basically their food. Um, in current siphon pulls water in from the outside world. The water is going to pass over the gill. This guy right here is the gill. So as the water passes over the gill, we're going to kind of kill two birds with one stone. It's like they're breathing and eating at the same time, which is pretty cool. So as the oxygen flows over the gill, they pull oxygen from the ocean water. And as that current of water enters uh, their mouth, they have a mouth right here and uh, this weird organ called a palp. And the palp is basically like a sticky pad that like algae and, and microbes and junk stick to that palp. And it just kind of shunts it over to the mouth. Once food gets into the mouth, it goes through a digestive system, uh, just like we looked at with the earthworm. And uh, it's a pretty simple one. And then eventually that food makes its way out of the X current siphon, whatever it's not able to basically absorb into its body. And uh, so that's kind of the, the simpler view. I'll show you a little more complicated view um, with, our, with our diagram we have coming up here. So food particles get trapped in mucus uh, secreted by the gill and the palp. I'll show you the palp in a minute on a picture. It's a lot easier than the words, I think. Uh, but a palp is a sticky organ around the mouth. Uh, cilia will actually sweep food to the mouth. Cilia are the little cells that kind of beat in like a undulating motion, like the wave to push something one direction. Um, once the food's in through the mouth, it goes to a stomach, which is kind of cool. No crop or gizzard on this particular animal. Mouth to stomach. And there's a digestive gland attached to the stomach that's going to give us enzymes to help digest our food. Well, not us. You know, a, a clam. If <laughs> you, you know, you were a clam, which you're not. Indigestible material is going to travel right on through the intestine and exit the X current siphon. And so that's pretty much it. Pump water through the organism. Uh, it is a little more complicated than the sponge in that they have a stomach and that they have, uh, you know, a, I guess a simple little linear intestine. And so there's uh, some overlap with the sponge, some overlap with the earthworm, but it's uh, really a completely different organism. So it's uh, pretty cool to see those, those differences there. 
So this is the diagram I had you print or label or do whatever you wanted to do with. Uh, this is the diagram you most likely see on your test. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, it's, uh, it's a great one. It's, uh, the colors are, are very, make things much easier to see than they might otherwise be. And so let's talk about the stuff we've already seen. Um, mantle. This guy right here is the mantle. And uh, that's the part of the body that we're most used to seeing on clams and oysters and things like that. Then the foot, which we just saw with our burrowing clam digging down, really just a, a big muscle. And then, uh, so we have the incurrent siphon is here, and we can just kind of follow this flow through. So water gets pushed into the mantle cavity through the incurrent siphon. As water flows over the gill, the gill pulls oxygen out just like fish gills do, really the same thing, uh, or slug gills or snail gills or uh, you know anything else that has gills. And so the water kind of fills this whole chamber. The water eventually flows over here to the palp. And as it's flowing by, lots of little food particles get stuck on the palp. And this is all the algae and moss and things that are in that ocean water. And the ciliated cells on the palp are gonna push that food stuff right into the mouth, okay? And so once the food is in the mouth, it is transported down here to the stomach. This diagram just calls it the gut. And that's a, a simpler term to include stomach and small intestine. So the food particles make it to the gut or the stomach where they're stored for a while. Uh, they then travel through the intestine. That's this guy here. So the food goes through the intestine all along this coily path here. And this is where the clam is absorbing the nutrition from the food that it needs to grow. So it's taking apart those algae cells with enzymes and it's pulling in the raw glucose and that kind of stuff that's gonna be fuel for him. Now here's a very, very different body plan. Uh, the intestine then flows right through the heart. <laughs> that's, that's a little weird, um, especially considering how close it is to the end of this, this whole process but there's the heart sure enough and uh, so the food flows right underneath of that heart and then out of the x current siphon which is right here is where that food is removed from the anus and since the water flow in general is kind of going clockwise it's sort of caught up by the water that's flowing through this thing anyway and the waste particles are then discharged out of the x current siphon and uh, it's a pretty straightforward digestive system. Uh, it's kind of cool, you know. It's, uh, it's simple, it gets the job done. Um, it's very compact and it's, it's similar to an earthworms. Um, arguably a little bit simpler because it doesn't have a crop and a gizzard, um, but more complicated than the sponges, uh, simpler than ours, but it is a fascinating place for a heart. So um, let's see, you should know mouth, you should know palp, you should know foot. Um, It'd be good if you knew the heart. A coelom is a, is a hollow space inside uh, an organism that houses internal organs. And so this coelom is just literally a hollow space. Um, and that's, that's about it for that guy. I would like you to know incurrent siphon and excurrent siphon and a gill. And with that, we have our basic um, movement, respond to stimulus, nutrition, and then these are, of course, eggs for reproduction, and you've covered what you need for, you know, um, the, the characteristics for an animal. Okay, Thomas, would it suck its own poop in? Michael Crawford, probably not. Okay, great questions. Um, so, you know, Thomas, I think uh, the ocean probably has enough of a current that the small particles coming from, you know, it's, it's excrement, right, would probably be carried around in the ocean current. Um, is there a chance that it could, though, you know, excrete some and then and then consume it, pardon me, again through the incurrent siphon? I would say, yes, of course, that probably could happen. Um, and I doubt that it would do too much damage for them unless you were like, I don't know, intensively farming clams, right? And they were in like an enclosure where it was just their poop. That could be bad, but uh, I've never tried to grow them for agricultural purposes. So uh, that's a really good question, though. All right. Um, obviously, you should know the shell. Uh, the shell or the valve or bivalves are two shells, and the mantle is the body, uh, the yellow body here. That is what we pretty much see is just the mantle. So any questions about basic clam anatomy? Go once, go twice? No? Okay, cool. 
So um, some other organs you should be aware of, they have two pairs of gills. Gills do respiration for these guys. That's probably not a surprise to you at all. Uh, they have to get oxygen from the ocean and uh, release the CO2. Uh, gills are highly vascularized. Um, I know that you guys haven't probably gutted clams, but you've almost certainly gutted fish, right? You live in South Dakota, you've probably gone fishing. Um, and, and just kind of to help you make this comparison, your where you, sorry, I feel like you're staring at my ceiling. Okay, this is better. Okay, where you respire should be close to your heart, right? The heart pumps the blood. The blood needs to get the oxygen. So those two things should be close together. Uh, the heart and the clam is pretty close to the gills. In humans, your heart is right there, okay? So bear that in mind when you do the Pledge of Allegiance. Don't do that. That's, that's a lung and a deltoid. That, that's a heart, okay? So your heart's right here, and your lungs are here and here, okay? So your heart is like tucked into your lungs so that it doesn't have to pump very far to get that blood to the lungs. Now, if you've ever gutted a fish, you might be surprised to find that a fish's heart is about right there, right up under their mandible. And it's like, what do you, jawbone, perhaps you might know better, right there. And you're like, why, why would a fish's heart not be in its you know, thoracic cavity like every other animal I've seen? Why right here? And of course, the answer is what? Why is a fish's heart right up here? Gills. Because that's where the gills are. The fish's lung equivalent, being the gills, are right on the side of their heads. You tuck that heart right up in those gills, and it doesn't have to pump very far to get good vascularization or blood vessel supply into the gills. And so that's why they're organized uh, the way they are. So bear that in mind when you look at clams and their hearts and, and, and thinking of how small this heart is, that's the, why they're organized the way they are. So water moves through the gills and oxygen moves and carbon dioxide moves. Uh, generally speaking, we're gonna want oxygen to move in to the bloodstream from the ocean water. And we're gonna want carbon dioxide to move out. That's the way it works in your lungs. That's the way it works in fish gills. That's the way it works in a clam. That's what you want. Um, and that's how you, you need that oxygen to be you know, burning glucose and making ATP, which you guys learned about forever ago. Uh, their heart does have blood, but their blood's not red like ours. It has almost no color. Uh, they're pumping heart to just a few blood vessels and a kidney. Um, if they can get blood vessels to the intestine, blood vessels to the lung, blood vessels to the kidney, they're going to be in pretty good shape. So there's not um, a, a terribly complex vasculature. Um, it's, it's more complex than, say, a sponges, which has no heart, <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, it, gets, it certainly gets the job done. So that's uh, the heart. Uh, strange thing to have colorless blood. Certainly strange, but it gets the job done. So that's kind of cool. All right. So here's the circulatory system of a clam. Uh, here you have the heart. We just call that a ventricle. Your heart is super cool. Uh, it has two atria and two ventricles, and that allows it to separate the um, deoxygenated from the oxygenated blood, which is awesome. Four-chambered hearts are like the bee's knees of the cardiac world, but not all critters have four-chambered hearts, which means the oxygenated and the deoxygenated can kind of mix, which makes them less efficient. But it's not like this clam is running a marathon, so he's fine. Here you have the ventricle pumping the blood. You have a pretty simple blood supply running through the mantle, a blood supply running through the gill, a blood supply running through the stomach, the mouth, and the foot. And that obviously all these places between the red and the blue are going to be capillary beds that are allowing red blood cells to give that oxygen off to the cells in the foot, cells in the mantle, the cells in the whatever, right? Capillary beds do the same thing in your brain and the same thing in your muscles and the same thing in your intestines. They do the same thing everywhere, right? Capillaries, capillaries, capillaries. So that's pretty much the cardio. Can we say cardiovascular? Yeah, we can. Cardiovascular system of a clam. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm used to human anatomy, so I get kind of nervous when I'm using those terms with clams. I'm not sure if that's actually true. Um, their nervous system is a, bit, a pretty simple brain. They do have three rather large ganglia. Uh, they have nerves all over their entire body. Um, they have touch receptors on the edge of their mantle so that if a predator or a person um, touches the edge of the shell, they can feel that and close, which makes a lot of sense. 
they reproduce sexually, not asexually. Uh, you so you can't you know cut the clan in half and have two clans later. It's not going to work that way. Um, it's very similar to sponges in, in that sense. They have ciliated larvae after the sperm meets the egg. They become ciliated larvae, and that's called a trochophore. You do not have to spell trochophore correctly in your test. That's kind of a tough word. But the ciliated larva essentially swims away, finds a comfortable place to land, sinks to the bottom of the ocean floor, starts to produce its own shell, and then carries on with its own life um, after that. So it's kind of a cool, a cool system. This is a trochophore. It looks nothing like a clam, right? That thing is crazy looking. It looks like a, I don't know, like a football. I don't even know what that thing looks like, <laughs> but they have a mouth. They have, you know, a gut, a stomach, an in-current and ex-current siphon, little cilia to swim them around. And it's just, it's ridiculous <laughs> the way these things look. I don't know if 